adjusting our inward and outward senses to the rhythms of nature. I was transformed from what I witnessed from my window by Walter Baum, published in The Environment. The house was quiet. I sat on the couch alone, sipping a potent Irish breakfast brew, watching the birdhouse through the window. I grabbed my Nikon. The finches were busy. Something was up. It wasn't the usual behavior. The manic flitting here and there and nesting for material for food. The male finch seemed particularly anxious. He perched on top of the cedar birdhouse I bought from Amazon. He was squawking. I mean, squawking mean. Meaner than the times I'm underneath his house, mulching my peppers. A small head poked out of the hole. Was the head ready to launch? The previous year, I stuck the birdhouse on top of a metal pole from Lowe's, thinking a birdhouse would be a good thing. I love life to surround me. It's not something my 20-year-old self, cool self, would ever do, but we are evolving creatures, right? I sipped my tea and watched. My wife teases me that I share so many similarities with old ladies, tea, books, gardening, and birds. I don't know the head coach of the Yankees. The engine of a car is a mystery, and installing a mailbox is my defining achievement of home improvement. But ask me about worm composting and calcium for tomatoes <laughs> and all my circuits fire. I placed my tea down on a Tonewood Brewery coaster on the wood table, respecting the wood, an inch closer to the window. I still don't know what I saw was accurate, but the finch swooped down, grabbed the young chick, this finchling with its beak, and tossed the cautious chick out of the house. The chick, now an official bird, just like that, flew to a lilac twig. A successful launch, I suppose. Yeah, but now you need to attract another bird. I'm not enough of a birder to know if such tactics are widely used, throwing this punk and lazy chick from the basement, but it was a powerful reminder of its pain and necessity. Time to find his own food and to mate and to make his own nest. It's what Emerson taught me about self-reliance, except for the times I need an oil change and my gutters cleaned. I went about my day puttering around, making cookies, cleaning, cutting, craft, brew, six-pack cardboard boxes for a future wall art project, wishing my wife needed me for, for something. If I'm needed, there is no excuse for putting off what you should be doing, right? Preparing for the next stage in life? <laughs> but don't we love explainable excuses for procrastination? Instead of the hard stuff, I located every rechargeable battery in the house that needed charging. I scrubbed the stove and washed down the white kitchen cabinets. I gazed out of the window and realized the morning glories could use some worm compost. And a squirrel had toppled a few edging stones. Nature doesn't love walls, right, Frost? So I dug through my worm bins, wishing good morning to the thousands of worms that toiled in my tea bags and leaves and lettuce scraps and tomatoes. I don't think tomato seeds ever get composted. Just too hardy. And the tomato plants pop up in the most unusual places. And I fixed my rock wall until toppled again by a squirrel or a skunk or an opossum. Tired, wishing someone would come home, I sank down on the sofa again with a new hot mug of Earl Grey and took out a pen and paper. Typing on the computer leads me into internet wormholes of despair. Then I saw the finch again. Oh, that busy, busy finch. But something was amiss. What was wrong, finch? Why no longer alive with activity? Why so dormant as a winter morning? Why just stand still? For a long time, he remained motionless. Did he want a sofa too? To chill? Relax? Did he have no idea what to do either? His head would turn here, there, as if to see the world anew, no longer what was needed for the nest or his brood. He was successful. He mated, raised the chicks, 
his replacement in the natural world, and now they were gone. Gone. Just gone. Would they return to say, hey, Pops? Would they stay local? Keep in touch? Did he cry a finch tear, remembering the stench inside the birdhouse with all that chick poop and chirp, chirp, chirps for always more and more food and attention? Was he bored? Was he ready for a new family for the next season? Did the neighbor's cat kill his beloved Mrs. Finch? I wrote this observation down. I am that bird. So many of us are that bird. For years, I complained about driving my girls to dance practice, to a bassoon tutor, attending football games for a successful marching band where the football team always lost by like 93 to 3. I'll fly here, there, and everywhere like Paul McCartney, only not as good looking, and cook dinners every night. But oh, that finch. I'm that finch. Call me Mr. Finch. But unlike the finch outside, he eventually flew away, off for more work and labor, but I just sat there with my cheek warm with the tea. My insides were warm now, too. So it now, Father Finch, at 52. Now I'm off to my own labors. Time to write, finalize that memoir, edit once again that completed novel, and outline a new novel. Make dinner for the wife, be there when she needs me, and give her space and time and care for her to get through this hectic stretch of her life. Tend to the garden, contemplate landscape changes, where to put the next birdhouse, even in winter. Finish reading that biography on Napoleon, then join my friends for a craft brew at Tonewood to talk music and literature at our next podcast. Yes, Daddy Finch doesn't need to be so lonely. Now he can nurture his own needs, but still be there as an advisor and support a finch for when the chicks visit or when the busy wife needs a back rub and an ear. Thank you for reading. Oh, by the way, the title comes from Emerson's Nature, Chapter 1. Thank you for listening. Take care, everyone.